This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. It's Friday. Welcome to Real Talk. It's Jesperson and Hicks wrapping up a week. There's something, there's a real vibe in here, Johnny, when we got an in-studio roundtable, oh, yeah, and I'm love looking forward to this. Coming up on the, this uh, Real Talk roundtable, uh, we're doing this in partnership with our friends at Edify. They do just an amazing job, and their new issue is out. This is the May issue uh, at edifyedmonton.com, The Art of Innovation. They're celebrating innovators. We're going to meet three of them today, and they're going to blow your mind. I guarantee it. What they're doing in things like accessibility and mobility, what they're doing with artificial intelligence, what they're doing with divorce proceedings. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Family law. We're going to get into it. You know, it's one of those awkward conversations that people don't typically yeah. have. They don't have them at least in front of their partners, their spouses. I think it's getting less awkward, though. It's very common. Isn't it like half? Divorce? It's like 50% now. So, yeah. yeah. And what's the common theme? Oftentimes when people go through the process, when they go through a divorce, the common theme is that everybody gets put through the ringer. Everybody yeah. gets put through that washing machine spin cycle. Uh, they come out of it six figures poorer mm -hmm. or more um, and, and and still kind of wondering what the hell happened. Mm -hmm. And so one of our panelists is totally changing. She's she's blazing a trail in the province of Alberta. And, and if I understand it correctly, we'll ask her uh, in Canada with, yeah. with regards to the laws around how divorces or proceedings can happen before the court. Yeah. Uh, and the idea being that uh, couples are sharing a divorce lawyer. Oh, which to me sounds like something you wouldn't want to do. It sounds like a conflict of interest. Well, right? I think it depends on on how the breakup's going, but I, th totally. I think it could work better because I think a lot of people just want fast, quick, least pain involved kind of thing, right? And so. They don't want to pay the lawyers, you know, one hundred fifty grand. No, they want to leave something that. for the kids. They want to make sure that nobody wants to burn the other person's house down. Mm -hmm. So so Melissa Bourgeois is one of our guests, one of our panelists, and we're going to get to that in about 20 minutes or so. Uh, we also, of course, want to let you know that Trash Talk is coming up. And, and as we near the election in Alberta, this is what the month of May is all about on Real Talk. We were pedal to the metal on it this week. We're going to be pedal to the metal on election issues and storylines, talking to the power players uh, between now and May 29th this edition of Trash Talk today presented by Local Environmental Services is an Alberta politics edition and we have some absolute bangers to put in front of you. A lot of you have a lot to say and you've been saying it to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We're going to kick off with a, a celebration of film and, and, and a movement to preserve the art house cinema. When's the last time you actually went to a theater? When is the last time you actually went to a Theater. Oh, we talked about popcorn, this yesterday. Yeah, sat in the seats. Yeah, I went to the the Batman, which yeah. uh, was the new one with the guy from the Twilight Saga. I always forget his name. Robert Pattinson. Patterson. Yeah. Pattinson. Yeah. Anyways, but we got in the theater, and same thing. I was like, oh, this is after COVID, my first movie. Yeah. Like, the smell of the butter. Everyone getting in their their seats, doing the trivia before. It's a whole experience. And then I didn't know the movie was like. Two, two hours, 40 minutes. My wife's like, what are we doing here? Like and we're, we're totally out of, well, I can't say we, I won't speak for you, but I'm totally out of sync with regards to how you used to watch movies. Like, like we're so used now to pausing them mm -hmm. and being at home and like rewinding, Captions. Fast, you know, not paying attention. And, and, and when a movie just starts and there it is, and that's the start time and the wheels are <laughs> yeah. up and now we go. It's like, oh, yeah, this is how it used to go. Uh, we're going to talk to a filmmaker who's uh, screening at Northwest Fest. Uh, a couple of showings, as a matter of fact, over the next number of days and looking forward to getting into the the premise and uh, the, the motivation behind the, the film only in theaters. Everybody's talking about it. Uh, this episode of Real Talk is presented by our friends at We Know Training. You can check them out online at weknowtraining.ca. Are you, is your company ready to take training to a whole new level? Look no further than We Know Training. Their company partners with associations across the continent, delivering world-class online training, continuing education, professional development, and credentialing programs with their top-of-the-line LMS software associations 
and regulators can generate new revenue streams and support their operations by monetizing their training programs. Well, what does this enable them to do? Well, they can fund new initiatives, create even more exceptional training opportunities. Association members also benefit from programs by enhancing everything else. I mean, you're on top of the latest professional development trends. You're becoming experts in respective fields. It's a win, 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 win. If you're an association leader looking to create new opportunities for your members and your organizations, do not miss out on this exciting chance to partner with We Know Training. You can shoot them an email to partnerships at weknowtraining.ca or check them out online at weknowtraining.ca. Well, this is screening at Northwest Fest, the International Documentary Festival, right here in Edmonton on Sunday and next Wednesday. Here's a peek at Only in Theatres. I hadn't heard of the Lemley Theatre chain. As soon as my wife and I moved here, it became second nature. It was a family business from the beginning. I did grow up in a movie theater, and my mother did nurse me at the box office when she was, you know, selling tickets. Greg did not grow up planning on running Lemley Theatres. He would have been a great rabbi, I know that. My brother-in-law didn't want to come to America, and Kurt was convinced that the Nazis were coming. In the 30s, my grandfather Max and his brother Kurt had a chance to get out of Germany because their father's first cousin was Carl Lemley. Now, Carl was the founder of Universal Pictures. It's a straight line from Carl running Universal to bringing Max and Kurt in to work with him to Max and Kurt starting Lemley Theaters. There really has been a Lemley in the film business since there was a film business. That's what he says there. That's the reality. What a legacy. This film is directed by Raphael Sabarge, who grew up in New York City. His first gig, his first time on a set, four years old. You've probably heard of the show Sesame Street. He earned his first Emmy nomination in 2020 for L.A. Foodways, a feature documentary that he directed and produced He's won a number of awards around the world, including in Asia, for his work on a really remarkable film about an immigrant Korean family, The Bird Who Could Fly. It also won Best Director at the Awareness Festival. The focus of many of Raphael's films have been about social justice, environmental justice, and undeserved voices. He joins us live on Real Talk this morning. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you for making time for us. Oh, great to be here. What a cool show. I, I uh, really admire what you guys do. So thanks for having me. Well, thanks a lot. And that means a lot coming from you. Four years old. I mean, you've probably told the story a million times. Uh, <laughs> you and I, I think, are of approximately the same vintage. So you're on set taking it all in. I understand your mom was like a costume designer or something. In the meantime, I'm along with millions of other children lapping up every single second I could get of Sesame Street. Is that when you fell in love? Yeah, I mean, it was before, it was really like one of the first years, it was like the first year of Sesame Street, and so they were looking for kids. I was living on the Lower East Side, and I got invited down, and I, I met Big Bird, who I was captivated by, and and um, and Oscar, and then uh, what uh, Mr. Uh, what Mr. Hooper uh, basically uh, sat me on a donkey, and my dog is walking, hold on a second. <laughs> we're a very dog friendly show here so you got the only the only show. rule is come you got to you got to tell yeah. us about your dog introduce them please yes come here come here come here he's right she's a puppy <laughs> she's ah. what kind of puppy so, do you anyway, have? I, uh, sesame street was a wonderful um sort of memory and experience I, I did i did a bunch of them and they they wanted me to be on more and my mom did one of his stage mothers so what happened was i ended up um, not doing that, but I ended up, uh, sort of, uh, you know, finding my way to being an actor, which is what I've done my whole life. Yeah. And not, to, not to name drop. And I promise you, we will talk about your film. We will talk about only in theaters, but as I understand it, your very first film you were cast in your very first studio film alongside a, a, an up and coming actor, Tom Cruise, right? Risky business. Your very first film. Yeah. I ran out of high school. I mean, I, I did another film at 16, which was an independent film. And, um, did my first Broadway show at about 16 and uh, basically I've been, you know, I've been working my whole life, uh, which is an astounding thing. Um, uh, I'm something I'm very grateful for. Um, I'm also going to be in uh, The Exorcist, which will be out in in the fall. They're remaking it with Alan Burstyn and uh, uh, it's going to be a big universal release uh, release in the, in the fall on Friday the 13th. So you so you act you've been acting for like, you know, the better part of five decades. But but a, a while ago, what was it about uh, just a, just a short number of years ago, you decide to make the move to director. Um, right. Yeah, was that about, I mean, about I, 10 know, years a, ago? There's 
Yeah, there's about 12 years ago. I mean, you know, there's a there's a thing that happens with actors, no matter how much you work, there's always time off. And and then, you know, as we um, kind of evolve, as uh, as I've evolved as a storyteller, I, you know, w- was looking for other ways to tell stories and have, you know, wonderful friends that I've met on sets. And, and it kind of migrated into turning into kind of a larger um, sort of a you know, expansion of of, uh, of of what I've done. Um, I you know, again, I'm I'm only as good as the people that I get to work with, and they're incredibly, incredibly talented. But um, I you know have found that I really enjoy telling you know visually telling stories uh, from behind the camera. So you have this appreciation. What we're establishing here is an appreciation not just for the art of film, the art of storytelling, and the role that film has played in in culture around the world, including, of course, American culture, but the theater itself Uh, you've had a connection almost would you call it a visceral connection a very sentimental and professional connection to actual brick and mortar theaters for the better part of your life yeah i mean i i literally grew up backstage my mother you know and father met at yale the drama school he was a playwright she was a costume designer i i spent all my life kind of uh, running around backstage and theaters are sacred ground um you know in the evolution of this film um which is going to be playing in edmonton which i'm so excited about um i uh you know really was taken by this legacy story there's an incredible legacy story as you suggested there's a been a lemley in the movie business and there's since there's been a movie business this family has influenced you know over a hundred years of filmmakers and and carl lemley of course you know the the one of the first moguls in 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 hollywood um who started universal pictures but but the lemley theater chain if you don't know the lemley theater chain or if you don't if you've never been to los angeles if you don't even like los angeles <laughs> Don't worry. The, the fact is that it, it's a story about a family business. In this case, it's a, um, you know, small family business with this art house theater chain. At the end of the day, it really is about their struggles to sort of find their way and 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 their commitment to resilience and to family, et cetera. But, but it is also a kind of a microcosm uh, of the macrocosm, which is, you know, theaters in general have been struggling. You know, COVID couldn't have come at a, at a worse time. Um, obviously, you know, we're already distracted with, you know, social media and all the other video games and everything else that would have taken us, you know, we would, everyone used to go four or five times a week back in the, you know, in the forties, then television came in and everyone stopped. Um, people have come back, but, but it is a, it's been a challenge to get back physically into the space where we watch a movie. And, and, um, uh, this is a story about a, a theater chain that's really sort of struggling. And perhaps there's one just like it in Edmonton. You know, it's we, we talk often of, of of trends and how people spend their time or how people spend their money. And, and you touch on things like, you know, we talked to author Johan Hari a while ago about our, our fixation. Oh, you know, Johan Hari, like unbelievable, yeah, oh right? Yeah, what a cool guy. Oh, my gosh. And his, his book, Stolen Focus. And he talks about how our focus has been stolen from us and how we can get it back in our relationships with tech. I was joking yeah. with Johnny, who produces this show. But for me, it takes a little getting used to again, getting back into theaters after COVID, realizing there's no rewind, there's no skip, there's no pause button, there's no captions. But that's also the beauty of it. What do you think? presents or represents the biggest challenge to the health i'm talking about the entire industry here of theaters right now we're emerging from covid people are getting some of their confidence back uh, with regards to heading out and and, and socializing with other people what do you think is the biggest hurdle you know well here's several things i can say about this number one is that um obviously people communed with their couch right they uh have uh you know found their spot that they like and they sit there you know, the hope, of course, is that we can get up and out and back into the world. Um, we know just from a from a societal point of view that there's been a huge uptick in, in depression and anxiety and, and chronic loneliness and, and sitting at home and watching a movie is necessary. It, it can be considered part of that. Um, what I'm what I'm also aware of the fact is that some of the biggest movies of all times have now screened and, and is are, are bringing in huge box offices, not the least of which, of course, is this weekend, Mario. Mm. You know, last week, I guess it opened, but it crazy, crazy numbers. And, you know, uh, between Avatar and Spider-Man and Top Gun, the, the, the fact is that people do love going to movies, to the big movies. That is the big tentpole movies. Um, and, and I and I, you know, it's Cinecon, which is the kind of the national conference, the year of the conference, which happened, uh, I think, about a week ago. Uh, they're bullish on, you know, movie theaters coming back. Uh, the stocks are up. Things are good. Um, and, and and that's that's a great trend. I think people are finding their way back. 
the, the question in this case is about the smaller movies. Some of the movies that, um, you know, don't have superheroes in them that aren't necessarily um, uh, about, uh, you know, big effects um, that are more thoughtful and more um, more aimed at your heart and or your, you know, kind of a thinking man's film. Um, I think uh, that many people consider smaller films something you can watch on a smaller device. And, and, and that's, that's what we're trying to sort of get past because in point of fact, actually, the smaller intimate films do really um, give us, uh, on a big screen, on a big 60 foot screen, give us a maximum impact. And, and that's what we're trying to sort of talk about is the experience of going to the movies. Can you take us into the the mind or like the process of a director? And, and when you're telling a story, um, are, are you thinking of it or processing it or like storyboarding in your mind so it translates well on a big screen? Like does the actual physical cinema factor in to the storytelling process from from your perspective as a director? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, here's the thing. It's a 125-year-old art form, right? The, the whole concept, uh, the whole design around this art form is that you come and you gather together in a group. You come into a dark space real estate dedicated to the experience of the movie. You come in as strangers, you leave as friends because you have this shared experience. You you also then are on a screen, you're facing a screen that has, you know, by its virtue of its size, it basically kind of gives you some a scale that allows you to sort of fall into it. And and then and then sort of in a way, at least unplug all of the thoughts and the things that might be preoccupying you during the day, the constant noise and the rattle that we walk around with. It is a it is an opportunity to sort of time travel and sort of be lifted into another place. And, and, and all of those things happen with a great sound system and comfortable seats and some popcorn in your lap, basically that kind of take you away. Um, this is the, the the magic of the movies. And, and um, this is what um, I know, I mean, look, all of the streamers and, and obviously all of the opportunities the filmmakers have now to reach wider audiences, you know, in, in 250 countries, et cetera, et cetera. Th this is great. I mean, this is wonderful for the art form. However, um, I, I, there is not a single filmmaker who will tell you that they won't uh, jump at an opportunity to see their movie in a theater. Yeah. Um, it is a it is a much different experience. And why people like Cameron Crowe and James Ivory and Ava DuVernay and Alison Anders and, and all these wonderful filmmakers, Oscar winners and nominees, who basically said, I want to talk to you about this because uh, movies in theaters are really important, not to just to me as a filmmaker, but to the art form as well. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting debate, I think, that you could have, isn't it? Is 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 Amazon Prime and Netflix um, and and maybe not Disney Plus. Maybe that's a bad example because they're they're showing or streaming a lot of films that already were in theaters. But are you know is Netflix and Amazon Prime the enemy of of the cinema business, or are they keeping people engaged in film, reminding the public how much the public adores film or needs film in a way for cultural connection? You could probably argue that from a number of different angles, couldn't you? Yeah, no, it's it's a really interesting question. I mean, one of the things that's just happened over the past couple of months, which is wonderful news for film and theaters, is that this whole day and date thing, which, you know, happened during the pandemic, where they basically would open, you know, movies in a few theaters and then open them online at the same time. What What's happened is that the studios have realized that they've literally left money on the floor and, and they're not going to do that anymore. Every studio except Netflix is doing that. Netflix is committed to just doing, having a streaming kind of uh, universe or at least just sort of playing for a week um, to, to qualify for whatever awards they want. But but at the end of the day, I I I believe that there's a universe where both streaming and, uh, you know, movies in theaters can coexist. I think we have to get back to being reminded about why it's wonderful to go to a theater, what what it means. And, and, and look, above and beyond that, this film really, as I say, is a is a story about a family business. It's a very personal and intimate story. Uh, the family shared. You know, I spoke to four generations of Lemleys, um, and, and and if anyone's been in a family business or or you know understands the pressures and the complexities of that, um, this really uh, speaks to that. So it's not just a you know it's not just a movie about go to the theaters. It really is a personal story um, of this family and, and what and how they. How they're managing the complexities of of generational you know generational leadership of the business. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a moving story. It's amazing. A fourth generation family business. A, 
uh, a family with uh, very interesting factors at play. I don't want to sort of ruin it too much because a lot of our audience is going to check it out at Northwest Fest this weekend. Wanted to let you know, by the way, Raphael, you know the, how the business has changed and creators are funding their projects in different ways. Um, a big part of what we do is made possible by uh, our Patreon supporters. Um, really remarkable. We're so grateful for them, and we're going to be sending 20 of them to see your film, um, which we're really excited about. So there will be some real talk Patreon supporters, some patrons, we'll call them, um, in the audience checking out your film on, on both Sunday and Wednesday. Let me ask you, is there, in, in, in the process of telling this story and speaking with you know members of this Lemley family, this legendary family, and other filmmakers and storytellers and people associated with the history and art and business of film, uh, was there something that caught you off guard? Was there something that made a lasting impression on you? Was there something that maybe even changed your mind or shaped the way that you think about an issue? You know, he, he, there's so many ways I can answer that, but this is the first one that pops into my head. And this is an astounding part of the sort of the legacy story. So Carl Lemley is this, um, you know, the immigrant Jew who came to America um, basically because he wanted to be a machinist or an engineer. And because he was a Jew, he couldn't. Uh, so he was working in the dry good dry goods business. And basically the story is that he was watching people line up at a place of business, leave money behind and take nothing with them. What was it? It was a Nickelodeon, which was the first movie theaters. So he thought, I like that. I want to try and figure out how to do that. So he literally saved pennies, saved pennies. And then he opened his own Nickelodeon and did very well and opened more. This was in Chicago. And what happened was he then wanted to make his own movie. And at the time, Thomas Edison owned all of the technology that basically kind of regulated the, the the making of movies. I mean, think Apple, right? Huge, huge kind of conglomerate that really was more interested in the patents in this case, that is the tech of it, than actually the movies themselves. And he said, that's ridiculous. He can't own movies. Um, you know, movie making began in Europe. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take him to court. And he took him to court, went all the way to the Supreme Court and won. And as a result of this four to four and a half foot, you know, Jew, pugnacious German Jew who came here, he basically David, David and Goliath's story. He went up against Edison. And because of that, won. And we have independent cinema because of him today. Absolutely incredible. Uh, this is Raphael Smarge that you're either listening to on our podcast or watching on YouTube. Uh, his film only in theaters. By the way, let me embarrass you for a second. Let me let me read some reviews here. How, how about this? I don't know if this will make you blush or not, but uh, people I think have heard of the L.A. Times. I'm pretty sure people have heard of the L.A. Times. Daily News, Film Treat, Film Week. Listen to this. Essential viewing for every film goer, says the L.A. Times. Beautiful and complicated. Beautiful and timely. An American story. And I love this review. This film could not be any more important that's got to make a director feel good oh god i've been so i've been so uh, so touched and moved by the response and and we really had a wonderful a wonderful run and um um you know the issues in it are important that the people we spoke to it, it's thrilling and and it you know it will have an afterlife um and it will find its way you know ultimately to streaming i, I made a movie however called only in theaters that couldn't just play only on streaming you know i i, I really was important to me we played I think 80, between 80 and 90 uh, cities now uh, across the states and internationally in, in, in Vancouver, as well as also, um, uh, of course, Edmonton, and uh, I believe we're coming to Toronto. But but the fact is that there's there's um, there there are theaters just like the Lemley, that is art house cinemas that care deeply about the, the 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 film goer and that audience and are continuing to sort of try and find their way onto their up onto their feet. Um, you know, one of the things I just want to say that's important to me just before we wrap up is just to say is that, um, you know, I I love Edmonton and, and I, I, I've i been there a few times, but I also uh, do the voice of a of a video game called Mass Effect, yeah. which comes out of Bioware, which, of course, is in the mighty city of, of Edmonton. And I, I I adore Bioware and I am so uh, proud to be a part of those games. Mass Effect is a, is a great game. But anyway, you are at the epicenter of truly the, the gold standard of video game creators. Amazing. I appreciate you mentioning that. Uh, Bioware is, is one of the, the greatest Edmonton success stories, um, to say the least. And then, uh, I don't know, are, have you, if, uh, whatever, I could get into the weeds on this. I get super excited talking <laughs> about, like, what the, like, uh, Ray Musica and, and, and uh, Greg Zaschuk and the founders of BioWare and then what they have gone on to do. 
uh, with their careers has been amazing. Putting money back yeah. into the city, investment back into places like next time you're here, you got to check out Richie Market Bira, which is just a fabulous restaurant. Blind Enthusiasm Brewing. I mean, all of these sort of can I call them cultural jewels um, have yeah. come about as a result of, uh, and maybe I'm oversimplifying the story. But the success of Bioware, which is really cool. So it has this sort of really spiderweb cool. effect in a really great way um, in how it continues to, to create and employ Edmontonians and generate revenue and all of the things that sound a little tacky to talk about. But that's real life. No, it's real life. And, and, and you know, what's been said, and this is not by me, this is by people that are kind of, you know, know, know the world, that, that Mass Effect was the equivalent of the, what Star Wars was to the movies. There's all the movies before Star Wars. And then all the movies after that's the that's the the brain trust, the, the amazing writing and the vision of Bioware that they were able to kind of really sort of, again, just sort of create, change everything, break the glass ceiling and then set the rules. And and uh, it's really something um, that you should be proud of for sure. Uh, well, I, I appreciate yeah. you saying that. Hey, when you're doing yeah. when you're doing voices, I know that I'm not naive enough to think that you're all all the characters are in the room at the same time. But have you ever worked directly with Mark Muir? Yes, Mark's a dear friend. I, I see him all the time at conventions. And we were at the Edmonton, I think we were at the Edmonton uh, uh, Comic Con, which is oh, where cool. we. Oh, cool. Yeah, Mark so is a great guy. People will know him as, as the voice of Commander Shepard in, in Mass yep. Effect as well. He was in the studio just a while ago talking about he's got a new sure. independent Batman short, which is super cool. You should check it out. I'll email That's it to you. That's great. All right. He's a great guy. Hey, Raphael, uh, it would be impossible for you to be any more enthusiastic or for you to have a bigger smile. Your face would snap in <laughs> half. Uh, you have infused energy into our show this morning, and your film uh, really is remarkable. People can check it out this weekend. That'll be Sunday um, at 2 o'clock local time. That's Mountain Time, obviously. And then Wednesday, next Wednesday at 4 p.m. at Northwest Fest. We've been talking to Raphael Sabarge. Thank you for your time, my man. Thank you. Great yeah. to talk to you. I Cheers. love it. I love it. Johnny, like, you <laughs> talk about somebody that loves what they do. Mm -hmm. That guy loves what you he does, tell. and he's good at it. Bioware, a big story, too. One of my friends was, worked at Bioware. He was one of the lead sound engineers. Oh, is that know? right? A little, little tech circle, but now he's got a big job. Went down to the big uh, San Francisco down there. So it's a big it's a big a story for Edmonton and a place where like creativity is bred and yeah. I just love that you brought that up. Yeah. Well, they're one of their and and that's a that that company is a story of, like when you start talking to people that have made huge impacts in their industries, mm -hmm. so many of them come back to BioWare. Yeah. Like it launched so many successful careers mm -hmm. and it made a lot of people filthy stinking rich. I was just going to say. <laughs> Cha -ching. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Uh, you can check out the full lineup for Northwest Fest. This is the uh, Northwest Fest International Documentary Festival at, uh, at northwestfest.ca and it's also a really exciting year for them as well because for the first time they're also partnering with the Rainbow Visions Film Festival. Uh, so Northwest Fest has been going for a couple of days already. May 4th it started, uh, I guess that was yesterday, all the way through to May 14th. So you got 10 days, more than two dozen and feature films, all of them screening at the historic Metro Cinema. Make sure you try the popcorn. Make sure you try the popcorn. And of course, stick around and join us for the Rainbow Visions Film Festival. That starts May 12th, also at Metro Cinema. If you're a Real Talk Patreon supporter, check your email right around noon today, and you're going to get your promo code for your tickets to go see only in theaters in theater. Our friends at Athabasca University want to remind you that there is no day like today. There is no time like the present to launch your next career move. Maybe it's a big life move. Maybe there's been something on your radar that's been capturing your attention. Is it AI? Is it a career in communications or human resources? What about research? What about environmental engineering? What about healthcare? I mean, Athabasca University has so many options, world-class accredited online programs and courses the best part about it, though, and here's what sets Athabasca U apart from any other post-secondary in Canada, it's the flexibility to learn at your own pace on a schedule that suits your lifestyle. You know, mom and dad are, are sick, or grandpa wants to take everybody on a family vacation, or the, the kids are on spring break, and you need to step away from your studies for a minute. You're not falling behind, because you're setting the pace when you attend and learn from and grow at Athabasca University. Are you a professional engineer? 
anywhere in Canada or even outside the country looking for a new opportunity? Would you love to apply your talents somewhere where they put people ahead of profits? And also, they're on the leading edge, the innovative edge of where automation is going in industry. Take two seconds today to check out apexautomation.ca. I know that this sounds funny. Some of you might roll their eyes when I say they are always hiring, but here's the deal. They are literally always hiring. That's how fast this company's growing, and it's no wonder why. You look at the future of energy extraction, mining, and resources. Where's technology going in agriculture, as an example? Autonomous vehicles and machinery, anybody? If this is capturing your attention, take a minute today to check out apexautomation.ca. You know who else is hiring? Our friends at Kubi Renewable Energy who are moving Canada's sustainable energy goals forward. One house, one farm, one big commercial building at a time. That's right. They're a full service contractor for residential and commercial solar power systems. And they've just partnered with APEGA. That's the industry governing body in the province of Alberta to offer engineering services. That's Kubi Renewable Energy. And they're hiring right now. They're looking for installers. They're looking for salespeople. At Kubi Energy, you can start your career today at the biggest and busiest solar installer in western canada you can find them online get your free quote today at kubienergy.ca this is an exciting time for us uh, to partner with our friends at edify they do an amazing job you can check them out online at edifyedmonton.com we know so many of you do of course a lot of you subscribe to the paper copy of the magazine there's nothing like holding a magazine in your hands of course they do a beautiful digital presentation as well and the may issue of edify celebrates innovation in particular the art of innovation and we're honored today to welcome three innovators featured in this issue. And they're joining me in the Real Talk studio for our Real Talk roundtable today. Melissa Bourgeois is an Edmonton-based family lawyer who's providing amicable divorce and legal separation solutions. She's currently running a pilot with the Law Society that could lead to a legislative change, a transformative change in how divorce is handled in our province. Nitty Hegde is a fellow and uh, AI chair at Amy, as well as an associate professor in the Department of Computing Science at the University of Alberta. And Arnie Andres is a director at Click and Push Accessibility. That's a company that's developed an app called The Atlas, which is helping uh, folks who use wheelchairs better prepare for journeys out into the community. Uh, all three of them joining us in studio. A good morning to you all, and thanks for being here. You know, Melissa, people are going to say, hang on a second, amicable divorce solutions? Is that even possible? <laughs> it sure is. Yeah. It absolutely is. And it's actually something that I'm finding a lot of people want for themselves. And so they're seeking out a service that assists them with doing that. How long have you been practicing family law? I've been practicing for a decade now. And you've yeah. probably seen uh, some pretty nasty stuff. I have, yes. Really sad stories of, you know, I mean, it's a really difficult time of life for anybody, but particularly when you're in a system that opposes you on each side and is kind of mystique driven, so you don't really know what's, what you're doing. Um, and all you really want to do is kind of come out of this in a way that you can raise your children together, um, because I find that for parents, that's fundamentally what they want is to have some kind of decent relationship with one another so that they can continue to be co-parents. So, so you're, you're working on, with the Law Society, you're running a pilot right now that, that's essentially, if I, if I can boil it down into layperson's terms, if I understand it correctly, it's two people uh, that, are, that are pursuing a separation or a divorce and they're using the same lawyer. There's one lawyer representing both of them. Yes. Now, of course, me knowing nothing about what you do, <laughs> but that never stops me from commenting. <laughs> It sounds to me like a terrible idea. A oh, terrible. And I'm just, I'm just joking. Of course, I'm just joking. Of course, yeah. but, but, but you look at divorce and everybody, everybody. It seems people go, well, I just want to make sure I don't get screwed. Exactly. Right. And so, yeah. so this is kind of why people would say, well, I'm going to lawyer up. I'm going to get the the biggest pit bull attorney I can find. What yeah. was it that prompted you to move in the opposite direction? 
Um, simply because I was finding that, again, people don't want a fight. They don't view themselves as opposing each other. They're not in an active dispute. And so that's what I'd been working with the Law Society of Alberta for two years in order to get the waiver that allowed me to practice this way. It's a model that I pulled from the UK. I'm working with my colleagues over there. And it's working incredibly well because people just want something that they understand. They want it to be relatively timely. They want to not spend all of their resources on it. So it's really just a shift in the mindset. And I think we're really ready for it. There's a lot of people, of course, the movies and TV, you know, everything is about that terrible divorce narrative. But now more and more, we're talking about, well, what's about the relationship that we had? And can we honor that in some way? And can we continue on together in this very strange way, but that works for us. And so it's been pretty powerful to be able to articulate it and then to kind of put this pilot project into motion and see that people are really responding to it very well. Hmm. So as yeah. is the case with any innovator, obviously you'll run into hurdles. There will be challenges, yeah. whether they're legislative or otherwise. Yeah. And we'll get to that in just a second, Absolutely. because there are some common themes here with, with all three of these stories. And I guarantee there's innovators that are watching or listening to this right now that will relate to, to a lot of your journeys. Arnie, how did how did the Atlas? How did this new app? How, how did the, how did the click and push accessibility initiative wind up on your radar? It strikes me as though this might have been pretty personal for you. It is, yeah, it is personal, uh, and um, we we started in 2018, and now the app is ready. So we need uh, partners and investors so we can move on to the next stage of doing crowdfunding or data. And one example of the things that you can see from the Atlas is uh, uh, the, the speed, the exertion levels of, of wheelchair propulsion users, uh, the amount of strain that a person can experience with their wrist and shoulders. So those are the things that we need to put in the app. And so Arnie, is this essentially, for people that have never heard of it before, this is allowing, like if you're heading out on a journey for the day, mm -hmm. you're gonna go to the grocery store, and then you're gonna swing by the dry cleaners, and then you know, you're gonna go to your, you know, where, wherever it is locally that you pick up your issue, or your episode, or your issue of Edify off the newsstand. You know there's those three things you gotta do. So you punch it into the app, is that right? And then mm -hmm. the app helps you forecast or see ahead of time uh, any mobility challenges mm -hmm. or other challenges that you might encounter? Is that kind of the basic premise? That's of correct, it? yeah. You, they can see the barriers uh, in the app, yeah. So how frequent would it be or how, how much of a regular occurrence would it be that you would be out and about and you would encounter an unexpected challenge, uh, so, something in your way? Almost all the time. That's why it has to be real time, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and so this is something where uh, ultimately – it sounds to me like the application to this could be almost limitless. Like this mm -hmm. could be technology that could be beneficial to people literally all, of, all over the world. And not to mention that right now we, we have construction ongoing like uh, every day and we have to put that uh, barriers in the app so that the people on the wheelchairs can see how much of these barriers is, is going to affect their travel in a day, yeah. Now, the, the AI conversation in Edmonton uh, seems to be something that just puts wind in people's sails. Like for, for and, and I'm saying for whatever reason, I guess in the form of a casual question, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, Edmonton has become, has established itself as what, one of the top five AI centers in the world? Is it, is oh, it fair to say that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely top three in, in uh, Canada. And I wouldn't say for whatever reason, because there are a lot of strong um, AI pioneers in Edmonton uh, from the U of A. Um, and then we have institutes like Amy, and then we have a lot of small startups and small businesses that are innovators in AI in Edmonton. So, yeah, definitely Edmonton is a hotbed for AI. Yeah, and, and, and of course, it's been intentional moves. I don't think that it yeah. happened accidentally. Exactly. What drew yes. you to the field of, of AI? What was it for you that when you, you, you were looking where you would apply your talents and your expertise and your mm -hmm. research, what was it that intrigued you in particular about what you're doing now? 
Um, well, as I moved more and more into AI, um, I actually worked on a lot of different things earlier in my career. Um, I realized it's using a lot of data about people. That's one thing. And then the other thing is that whatever we're building with AI has huge impacts on society. Um, and there aren't, there weren't at the time anyway, too many people thinking about that. So that's what I was really interested in, is looking at how can we do this in a responsible way. Um, and you know, there's you know multidisciplinary approaches that are needed for this, mm. um, right? Like, so I'm from the tech side. I'm trying to look at what kind of algorithms can we put in place to make sure that data is protected, privacy is protected, to make sure that we don't have adverse impacts from AI tools like bias or unfairness, um, and then more and more these days, misinformation or disinformation. Um, so that's you know how I got into it is because I realized that there were impacts on society. Um, all of the gr you know benefits of AI are fantastic, right? Like you know we see this every day. It makes our lives much better. It moves industry forward. Um, all the personal assistance we have, you know, definitely helps us. But we also don't want to forget that there are also adverse impacts, and we want to take care of those. They can be huge, and people will be Absolutely. relieved to know there are professionals like you that are working on on privacy and ethics and AI. We, we've had conversations on the show even on how, on how you know, biases are, are, are almost remaining, like, you know, in oh, AI. Been, I mean, with regards yeah. to, for example, people applying for jobs yeah. and how resumes are being sorted. Yeah, um, and, and biases get exacerbated even mm. with AI. You know, there might be a little bit of bias in data. Like, for example, you talked about resume screening. So maybe historically, a certain company has only been hiring males, maybe only white males, and they're in executive positions. So that's the only data that they have. Oh, we have good performing white males. So then the data has bias because there aren't enough women or people of color that are present in the data to give the idea that they could also be high performing. Mm. So if you've got an AI tool that's using this past data, then it might be compounding the impact of biases. It's kind of funny, isn't it, how, the, how the, like the, the, uh, our collective consciousness works or how our minds work is like we don't pay as much attention to something like AI. Number one, I think because oftentimes its influence is subtle yeah. and oftentimes its influence is very positive. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but it's not until somebody mashes up like Drake and The Weeknd with an AI generated <laughs> yes. single and then all of a sudden the song's really good and we start to wonder what does that mean for copyright and who's oh, getting the yes. royalties and whatever and then all of a sudden we, and yeah. then we start talking about chat GPT but like are, are, mm -hmm. are we still like society wise I'm not asking you to insult all of us, but but are we still sort of in the waiting pool, the, the shallow end, at least with our understanding of the applications and the implications of AI? Yeah, I think there's definitely a lack of awareness. Um, I think it's getting better, though, um, especially with tools like ChatGPT that any person can just sign up and start using. Um, when people start doing that, they start thinking about, oh, wait a minute, is that what I'm reading right? Um, you know, wait a minute, like I just was able to do this so easily. Could someone with, you know, malicious intent can also do this easily? Sure. Right. So I think we're getting better at it. And definitely. Um, and when I say we, I mean, educators and people who know tech should um, do a better job of making people aware of, you know, like you said, AI subtle right mm. like that's the whole idea you want things to just happen for you naturally yes that's the point of ai but we also want to be aware of um these other impacts i keep i keep telling johnny it's blowing my mind on on literally on a daily basis do any of you use the ai dj on spotify <laughs> have any of you used this i have not used it It will blow yeah. your mind <laughs> yeah. and it's like it's and he it's it's not like hello welcome to spotify here it's like the, guy, the guy's like what's up ryan <laughs> He's like, how you doing? He's, he's like, your friend. he is. He's like, I'm your AI DJ. And he's like, he's like, what? Hey, whatever happened to this song? He's like, you listened to this a lot four months ago, and then you stopped listening to it. He's like, here it is again, and then it plays it. I'm like, yeah. what is going on right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's I mean, just wild stuff. And and I do recognize that AI is in more influences than pop culture, but these are just the ones on my radar. Oh yeah, that's actually a very good example because you know people are talking about these images that AI can generate, right? And now it's able to generate videos for you. So all you have to tell it is, hey, I want to see Ryan Jesperson walking a dog or something. Yes. I don't know. And it'll generate one <laughs> yeah. for you. I'm going to get a video <laughs> so. of Ryan Jesperson working out at the gym. And <laughs> <laughs> you'd release it and see if anybody would believe it. Go. Hey, are you sweating? Yeah. Melissa, are you sweating chat GPT? 
Not really. Some not. people are saying that lawyers could be yes, among those. Yes, many to get lawyers. The- yes, but I think in family law, there's still an emotional component. Mm. So the link to your lawyer is still kind of pretty tight in that. But certainly, it's changing my profession as well. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay. So so are you though, yeah. right? I mean, are you, yeah. you you know with what you're looking to do? Yeah. Um, the, the number one thing. I don't know why I thought of this because this is such a tacky <laughs> way to look at this. But I thought I wonder if other lawyers are gonna are gonna push back on what she's doing because it's cutting fees in half. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, are, are, what, what's been the response from the legal community, from your colleagues, you know, in the context well, of what you're doing? Yeah. I mean, certainly, I think there is that question of, you know, well, what's going to happen if there's, you know, only one of us? But most of my colleagues are welcoming this idea as well, because it's easier for us in our caseload to manage a file from start to finish without kind of having to go back and forth and write a letter to another lawyer and wait for a response. And so it's kind of something that I'm finding a lot of my colleagues also want to be able to start practicing this mm. way one day as well. So, yeah. Real, real talk here, okay? Yeah. Real yeah. talk. <laughs> Lawyers and journalists yes. get a bit of a bad rap. We absolutely right? do. Right? Like, what, what did they say? Do. You know, this is like the most horrible joke of all time, but I heard somebody tell it at a podium once at an event I was hosting. Have you heard this? What do you call 100 lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? You've heard this one before. No. A good start. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, like, these awful, no, these for awful sure. jokes for sure. that people tell. Yeah. But, but something like what you're doing especially in family law. Exactly. I wonder if what you're doing will have this wonderful impact on how people perceive your profession. In other words, you truly care about the well-being of the family and the outcome of that separation. That's exactly right, Ryan. I think it's taking a more humanist approach to the law, and I do understand the the need for the rigors of laws to be in place, but certainly we as lawyers were not trained as social workers or psychologists, but particularly in such a sensitive area as family law, we do have to deal with a lot of those things with our clients. And so I think, you know, the more that we can dive into that, then the better the outcome is for not only our clients but us as well as lawyers because we are humans most of us <laughs> yeah, of course yeah. yeah it's like it's so funny me, yeah. me, me and my lawyer friends <laughs> sit around true. and feel sorry for ourselves we try to determine who's who's getting beat up more in the court of public opinion right now journalists or lawyers well i, know, I think but, we're probably on an even basis i think on yeah. an even basis but lawyers have been at it for a while yes. uh, you know but i mean that's yeah. hey i guess that comes with the territory right absolutely and we're changing and evolving just like everybody else absolutely. right and that's we're responding to the needs of our clients as best as we can I love talking yeah. to young professionals or younger yeah. professionals anyway to, to ha- come to a better understanding of what drew them to do what they do. Yeah. And some of those stories are, are you know wonderful inspirations and insights into essentially where those industries are going. Right? Exactly. These are the people that are making yeah. big impacts. Yeah. 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 When we talk about, Arnie, like challenges and barriers, I mean, we're talking actual, legitimate, physical, literal oh, barriers yeah. as part yeah. of the Atlas. But what have some of the challenges been aside from that that have come with putting an app together like the Atlas that have come through this process? What have you learned? Yeah, uh, like I s- it's personally uh, experienced like uh, because of the advances in machine learning and then we really need to apply the legislation. We need the lawyers actually to get this barrier-free Alberta in place, where the the last two remaining provinces in Canada that don't have the Accessibility Act in place. Hmm. Yeah, and that's kind of a dubious distinction, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and personally, because of the advances of machine learning and AI, uh, like this week we had workshops ongoing about brain computer interface, you know. Uh, like last Wednesday, because I can't play the games, I cannot use the controller. So we did an assistive device for myself using large buttons. And so Mm -hmm. I can compete with the robot arm that uh, we had last Wednesday. And guess what, who won? (laughs) Me. I was hoping you would say that, Arnie. (laughs) Now I can compete, isn't it? Uh, for people that are listening on the podcast that aren't seeing you, I want I want to let them know that your face just exploded into a smile when you <laughs> talked about that experience. Can I ask you about the personal side of that? When when a barrier is eliminated, when equ- when equal access is achieved, what that does for you? That's correct. It's amazing. Like I'm on, I can't believe that I can play the the games. You know, with I have limited function on my hands. And it's coming into me that it will go away anyway soon. 
and the technology is there like the blink of an eye you can control anything with with the head turn left and right with the blink of an eye you can do that. So can I can I ask a follow up question? When you say it's it's in your mind that it will go away soon, are you talking about the use of your hands? Is yeah, that what you're talking will, about? So that's a, a degenerative away. condition. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So I would imagine that, like you're saying, you're talking about machine learning and AI. Mm -hmm. For someone like you, mm -hmm. uh, this is a very personal, extremely high priority type that's thing. That's correct. That's why I'm staying with uh, academe. That's why I'm doing research, and hopefully, I can teach people about this because this is really very close to my heart. Mm -hmm. isn't, it, isn't it amazing what happens when you're, I mean, you're an expert here in the field of AI, and, and I know we're talking ethics and privacy and that, but just big picture. Mm -hmm. um, I always love when, when stories or issues are represented by a human being. Like yeah. your work is impacting this human being in right. a way that is making his life better. Yeah, that, that's amazing. So that's the the good side of AI, right? Like we can use all of these methods we already are learning about and all these AI algorithms to good use. We can, you know, we can use them. And there are research, there is research being done on that. Um, Ernie is one example. There's also other people, um, uh, other fellows at AI and also at the University of Alberta that are working on AI for prosthetics and so on. So mm. there's a lot of new research being done on these things. Uh, can, can we get into the privacy side of it? Yeah. Like when you, when you look around you to, to, to the rest of us plebs that have no idea what's going on, we don't have your level of understanding or expertise, do you see people risking uh, data loss, privacy loss, security leaks like everywhere you turn i mean you're just nodding right now all the time yes literally everything we do um you know you're putting up a video on tiktok you know maybe you're putting your own image out there right that's one simple thing do you not do that i don't have a tiktok account, <laughs> is it because of your understanding of ai I mean, it's for many reasons also i don't want to end up wasting hours <laughs> when i should <laughs> probably get work done so no, it, it's investing. But it's investing right. hours. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. No, but absolutely, like everything we do, right? Like, you know, I have, you know, these uh, personal assistant apps and uh, devices, right? Like Google Home and things like that. I know that I'm using <laughs> that for my benefit, but in using it, I'm also giving my data away, right? Like the things that I do in the morning, for example, or what my calendar looks like, you know, all of these things. Um, so there is a lot of potential for large privacy breaches when there's so much data collected about people. So it's not just, um, you know, data collected about you throughout the day. It's how multidimensional this data is. It's not just about this one thing, but it's also this and it's also that and something else. And when you add it all up together about one person, you get like, you know, a multidimensional picture of them. Okay. Right? So in so. layperson's terms, what's worst case for scenario for somebody that um, you know, on their Facebook page, they have pictures of their family and friends and their birthday. Uh, on their Twitter account, they tweet a lot about where they work. Um, on their TikTok, they show the exterior of their home um, because they're so proud of, like, they just shoveled the walk or look at my <laughs> new car. Maybe the license plate of the car is in the, they're not mm -hmm. thinking about that, right? Big picture, risk-wise, implication-wise, what is that person maybe unknowingly making themselves vulnerable to? Well, in general, all of this information about you pretty much tells you everything someone needs to know about you. So they could use this for any malicious intent, right? But there's also some examples, like for example, there's companies like Clearview AI that scrape the internet of data. This is for you know images, and it's you know a facial. They use they have these facial recognition software that they're selling to um, you know policing organizations <laughs> around the world. And if that you know if a picture of you is being used in that data, um, then if there's, you know, error rates, and this is where the bias comes in, if this algorithm is not very good at distinguishing you from another person, then, ah, you know, right. your image is being used for something, you know, and maybe you're being recognized as something you shouldn't be. Yeah. Or a lot of people are thinking about using facial recognition for, you know, entrance into buildings, right? You know, things like that. So there's a lot of data about you that's being used. It may be inadvertently used in um, for other purposes, and maybe you're being confused with somebody else. Yeah. Um, but there's also, you know, like all of these deep fake videos and, you know, um, 
the GPT style uh, tools that are coming out now. It's very easy for someone to take, you know, an image of you, your voice that's on TikTok, and then create a video of you doing something that you're not really doing. Mm. So, mm. you know, that's like the worst case sci-fi. <laughs> yeah. Although I, I, I can already think of a few of my buddies that this is music to their ears because they, you know, they are busted on video for stuff, and now they can just say it's GPT. New pranks. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. no, I'm kidding. Um, I, listen, I'm looking forward to connecting with the, the three of you as, as well as uh, some of the other uh, really remarkable people, including Sharmin Habib and Linda Ho, who are both going to join us uh, at this event that's coming up presented by Edify. Um, this is coming up on Tuesday, May 16th from 3 to 6 p.m. at Nate's uh, beautiful Productivity and Innovation Center. Have the three of you been in there yet? This thing is like no, the big, huge, grand ceilings and the architecture of it's amazing. It's such a wonderful wow. event venue space and the subjects of conversation. I mean, this is just the appetizer here on this Real Talk Roundtable. <laughs> uh, I guarantee you're going to have your mind blown uh, by these three and others. Early bird tickets are available until May 10th, 25 bucks a person. There's going to be refreshments available. There's going to be networking. Uh, after May 10th, it'll go up to $35 a ticket, and you can get your tickets online at edifyedmonton.com. That's also where you can check out more about the stories of these three remarkable individuals and the rest of this innovation issue, the art of innovation. Uh, we've been talking to Melissa Bourgeois, Arnie Andres, and Needy Hagday, and uh, I'm grateful for the three of your time, your insights, really doing incredible stuff, and, and I think that our understanding of these issues have been deepened because of your appearance here on Real Talk, and I thank you for that. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, you bet. We would love to see you there at that event. That is uh, Edify's innovation event coming up again Tuesday, May 16th. This conversation was presented by our friends at Eden Landscaping. They're bringing outdoor spaces to life and have been doing for more than 20 years. A custom landscape builder with a ton of on-the-ground experience in Edmonton and area. This summer, you're going to be able to see before and after photos of our project with Eden Landscaping. We're really excited about it. Right now, it's still in the before stage because the planning is happening. It's gone through to their designers. They've got the 3D rendering and they're working with our budgets, which of course is probably for a lot of people, one of the most, if not the most important factor. I can tell you it's been a delight to work with Mike and his team at Eden Landscaping. And I recommend them to you or anybody you know that's looking to bring an outdoor space to life. You can make contact with them today at Landscape Edmonton. Ca. Hey, what's your plan for celebrating Mother's Day? Have you thought about giving mom the sweetest gift of all? That is a Mother's Day cake from the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Uh, show your mom how much she means to you with a DQ Mother's Day cake. You can indulge in a moment of sweet celebration together. These decadent cakes feature the signature fudge and crunch center the best surrounded by dairy queen's world famous soft serve celebrate your mom and reflect on sweet memories while creating new traditions with a dq cake from the locations at palisades nemeo newcastle westmount and baseline road our friends at Friesen Brothers also have a great Mother's Day special, and that's coming up, of course, in person at their Friesen Brothers Fresh Market stores. On May 13th and 14th, all Friesen Brothers Fresh Market stores are hosting an all-you-can-eat Mother's Day brunch featuring all your favorite traditional brunch treats, as well as special desserts created by Friesen Brothers Red Seal Chefs. All of this available for just $25 a person, and every single mom in the house will receive a complimentary flower to make sure that she feels extra special. That's Friesen Brothers March 13th and 14th at their Fresh Market stores. This studio that we're so proud to welcome guests to was built by the team at Complete Care Restoration. Why should you choose them for the nightmare scenarios we hope you never encounter, fire damage, flood damage, mold, asbestos? Well, because they've been earning the trust of folks across the province and, of course, insurance companies as well. And if you can bring everybody on the same page to get a problem solved, that's a real testament to the team that's getting it done. Complete Care Restoration is available for construction and renovation projects just like ours. You can reach out to them today at completecarerestoration.com.
www.ca.ca or give them a call at 780-454-0776. Well, Johnny, it's an all politics edition of Trash Talk this week, and it makes sense as we are now full blown into election mode. And, of course, we want to let you know that next week we will continue with interviews, with newsmakers, with folks with some of the perspectives you're not seeing represented on the evening news. We want to dig into issues that really matter to people and make sure that those stories are being told. One way that you can do that is to send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com and let us know what's on your radar. What's providing maybe some optimism as you're seeing these election campaign platforms or what's making your skin crawl what's that burr under your saddle you know a perfect chance to air some of those grievances happens right now every friday as we wrap our week of episodes it's presented by our friends at local environmental services since day one we've called it trash talk all right this one from deborah who says ryan i would like to respond to the conversation you hosted on tuesday uh, between the UCP's Erica Barudis and the NDP's Cheryl Oates. Says Deborah. first of all, I am a cranky old woman, and listening to the UCP has made me even crankier. In the 90s, when my kids were in junior high, senior high, I volunteered with a grassroots group called Speak, Support, Public Education, Act for Kids. We fought against Ralph Klein cutting public education, and I am infuriated to hear Erica talk about funding for public ed. You know, tied to the ups and downs of a budget, funding programs like public education and public health care need the foundation of any budget to reflect that commitment. The cutting of those funds, including education assistance by the UCP, is destroying public education in Alberta. Charter schools are going to make it even worse. Listening to Cheryl Oates, though, gave me some hope for the future, and I'm glad that they represented and put their sign on my lawn yesterday, says Deborah. She says, I think that it's one thing to listen to the leaders debate, but I'm really glad that I listened to that segment on Real Talk on Tuesday because it reinforces messages straight from the team. Thanks, Deborah. How about this one from Mr. Dad, who says, Ryan, Johnny, I was struck by the disturbing demonstration of values on your May 2nd episode featuring the NDP and UCP staffers Cheryl Oates and Erica Barudis. Barudis attacks the NDP's position of prioritizing a children's hospital over private arena handouts. She then goes on to boast that the UCP feels spending more than $300 million for provincial taxes on a private arena for the obscenely well Healthy is equal to investing $40 million into a hospital for sick kids? That is not the Alberta that I want. That from Mr. Dad. And how about this one from Ronnie who says, Jespo, can we please give the whole democracy itself is on the ballot talk a freaking rest? It's tiresome, repetitive, and above all, completely fucking annoying. Like, yeah, obviously there are concerns and threats around the world. China encroaching on Taiwan, Russia's continued invasion and occupation of Ukraine. But to say that the UCP is threatening democracy is absurd, hysterical, and completely melodramatic. Now, let me be clear. I'm not a fan of Danielle Smith, okay? I dislike the UCP's policies and wholeheartedly disagree with their vision for the province. But can we give this hyperbolic bullshit a rest about the UCP? Nuance, pragmatism in political discourse in this province, in this country, and around the world has been dead for a long time, and it's time to revive it. Signed a tired follower of politics. That's Ronnie. You can send us your trash talk anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. It's proudly presented by Local Environmental Services. You can find them online today, Alberta and Saskatchewan, localenvironmental.ca. Coming up next week, we got a whole bunch of stuff in the cooker, but that doesn't mean there's not room for another perspective. We want you to engage with us. Leave a comment on our YouTube episode. Leave a comment on our podcast. Thanks for rating and reviewing it. And of course, don't hesitate to hit us up on our hashtag, RealTalkRJ. Have an amazing weekend. Some of our Patreon supporters, enjoy that film at Northwest Fest on Sunday. And we'll see you right back here with Charles Adler and more on Monday's Real Talk.
Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, Executive Producer Josh Dunford, Technical Producer John Hicks, General Manager Katie Cook Chivers, Account Coordinator Lawrence Durlego, Human Resources Lena Shepherd, Website Design Mike Johnston, Voiceover by me, Perry Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Supriya Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandy Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com.